uh, as I was saying now, uh, we will listen to Professor Flavia Britzioskov. I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing your name correctly. Uh, she received her early education in public schools in Savona, Italy, her BA from the University of Genoa, Italy, and her MA and PhD from the University of Washington, Seattle, in comparative literature. She joined the faculty of the University of Tennessee in 1988, immediately after completion of her doctoral studies. She has received numerous research awards and grants that has and has participated in many conferences. Since 1995, she has been the campus director of the cooperative exchange program between UT and the University of Genoa, Italy, organizing trips of UT fa faculty members to Genoa, of Genoa students to UT, and organizing two international seminars, one in Genoa and one in UT. She has been uh, invited to lecture at various international conferences, Genoa, Lisbon, and at national institutions, bring more College, the Catholic University of America, Kennesaw uh, State University, etc. In fall 2004, she was the director of the UT semester in Wales, Swansea, UK. Uh, since fall 2004, she has been a member of the editorial board of the journal Studies in European Cinema, University of Wales, UK, and for the Journal of Italian uh, Cinema and Media Studies in many for for many years. Sorry. Uh, she has been a reader for the University of Toronto Press Forum Italicum, uh, the Modern Language Journal, Heinle and Heinle, and Houghton Mifflin. Professor Brizio Skov's uh, research has touched on a variety of areas, as of three monographs, one edited volume, and numerous articles show. She has worked on contemporary literature, critical theory, postmodernism, metafiction, metahistory, cultural studies, and cinema. Her research deals with popular culture in the Ital Italian cinema of the post-war period in, and in genre cinema. She teaches courses on a variety of topics related to 20th century Italy, dealing with literature, cultural studies, social history, and cinema. She also teaches a special topics course in Italian cinema every spring for cinema studies, and in fall she teaches an uh, introduction to world cinema for cinema studies. So quite an impressive resume. Uh, so, <laughs> well, uh, you have the floor, uh, Professor. Thank you very much, Natalia. Thank you to the organization of this splendid conference, and thank you for being here today. Um, I hope we, are, we weren't forced, <laughs> forced to be here. This is the third day of the conference, so I would understand. Okay, my, my talk today is uh, Matteo Righetto's Soul of the Border, a Western novel, Italian style. Um, I'm, not going to, I'm going to talk only about the westernness of the novel, but I want to give you a little bit of background, and because I can't do it, uh, quoting and so on and so forth, um, I'm going to use a little PowerPoint before I start reading my, my paper. So the novel came out in 2017 in Italy by Mondadori and then in English uh, for Atria Books New York in 2018. And this is, is Matteo Righetto for Italian standards and probably general standards, he is considered a young author. Uh, he was born in Padova in 1972. Um, he has already published many books, about 10. And um, uh, what is interesting, I have had the fortune, I mean, the luck to meet him, and uh, so I know him. He is uh, a devout mountaineer, and uh, he lives in a small village way up into the Alps um, as much as he can. He also lives in Padova, where he teaches also. Um, the importance, uh, the, the fact that he's a mountaineer is very important for his writing because most of his books deal with, uh, with uh, the mountains, the high mountains. Uh, the great majority of his novels deal with the wilderness, and in this case, the Alpi Trentine that I'm going to show you where they are. I'm sure you know where they are, but this is, will be where Venice is, and then Trento is here, and these are the Alps that he deals with in most of his novels. Um, let me give you some landscaping about the Dolomites. I'm sure you know, but um, in his books, 
it, rel it relates and it describes uh, insects, animals, trees, uh, plants, and he has an, almost the knowledge of a botanist, and uh, it describes also the landscape. And the landscape is majestic, as you can see here. And let me give you some other. So instead of narrating you uh, the, the, the story, I mean, the description of nature, you can remember these, uh, these uh, pictures. Um, these are mountains, the Dolomites, that are sparsely populated even today because of the harsh climate, especially in winter. Um, and you have, a, you have the pastures, and you have forests, and you have the, the glaciers. And this is a winter on the Dolomites, as you can see an avalanche in here, and it's also part of the, of the story of his novels. And finally, there are a lot of alpine lakes on the Dolomites, and in one of these, the protagonist of the novel takes a sort of regenerating bath, because this is a communion with nature, and so on. Anyhow, so um, the, the novel um, is part of a trilogy that is called the Homeland Trilogy, and uh, it, I'm only dealing with Soul of the Border here, but the other one are The Last Homeland and The Promised Land, and they deal all with the same protagonist. And they were published between 2018 and 17, and they have been translated all over in many, many, 17 languages, and they have been translated in English. Okay, so now I'm going to um, start my presentation, so you have an idea. Matteo Righetto's novel, Soul of the Border, uh, was published in Italy in 2017 by Mondadori. The novel, written in a sparing prose, is divided in parts, each containing almost an identical number of chapters that vary from half a page to a few pages long. The style is bare and at times somber, but there is poetry in the story, especially in the description of nature and in the interaction between the characters and the wilderness. Righetto's The Homeland Trilogy, of which uh, Soul of the Border constitutes the first part, has carved a niche for itself inside a substantial group of novels that deal with the wilderness whose most renowned authors are nationally Mario Rigoni Stern, Dino Buzzati, Paolo Cognetti, Mauro Corona, Francesco Vidotto, and internationally Jack London, James Femini Moore Cooper, Joseph Conrad, Robert Louis Stevenson, John Steinbeck, etc. In this category, we should also include more recent writers like Joe Lansdale and Corma McCarthy, whose epigraph taken from All the Pretty Horses 1992 is included in a Mandadori edition um, of Soul of the Border, alongside Righetto um, dedication. Let me get to the... Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, this is... I'm going to get there. This is uh, um, Righetto dedication. To the free, the just, the poets, the saints, spirits without borders. Okay, this is the righetto, and this one that I'm not going to read is Cormac McCarthy's All the Pretty Horses. It's a pretty, pretty dense uh, um, um, uh, paragraph by, by McCorm McCarthy. Um, McCarthy epigraph talks about beauty and suffering as two entities that in life diverge but are intertwined because the beauty of a flower requires, requires the tribulation of many people. Righetto's dedication relates thematically to McCarthy's epigraph because beauty and suffering undoubtedly um, permeate his novel. However, his words also anticipate that the story we are about to read celebrates fierce spirits, the ones that challenge existing borders, both geographical and moral, and the ones that oppose injustice, and the ones that have no fear, like the protagonists of the novel that are Iole, a uh, young girl, and Augusto de Boer, her father. At the end of the novel, in the author's note, Righetto claims that he found the inspiration for the story in two Italian novels, Arturo Zanusso, La strada delle piccole Dolomiti, 2010, The road to the small Dolomites, and Pietro Parolin's uh, Salta Boschi, Jump Woods, uh, that have, 2016, that have not been translated into any languages. Um, both writers are from the Veneto region, like our author, and both spe pay special attention to nature. Furthermore, the book cover of the Mondadori edition, here it is, 
um, evokes stylistically elements of a movie poster of a Sergio Leone film, um, uh, Sergio Leone Western. The black silhouette of a young woman see, seen from the back with long hair in the wind, carrying a rifle, wearing boots and a big hat, wa walking towards a range of rocky mountains, the Dolomites, under the huge disc of a red sun. This book cover, to together with the setting of the story, the forest of the high country of the Brenta Valley between the Asiago Plateau and the Grappa Massif, Mount Pavione and the Feltrine Peaks, contributed to convince the reviewers that Righetto's book is a Western novel. An excursus of the reviews published in various Italian newspapers is sufficient to affirm the soul of the border is considered a literary western, and Nevada, the name of the almost deserted hamlet where the protagonists live, a little far west. The book has been compared to Jack London's novel, labeled as an ecological novel, for its attention to the environment. And every reviewer has pointed out that the story takes the reader into a wilderness uh, where man, nature, and law clash. The reviewers have also concluded that Righetto's prior books, La Pelle dell'Orso, The Bear of the Skin, Savannah Padana, Bacchiglione Blues, have predisposed the reader to consider Soul of the Border as an Italian Wild West story because all the elements are there. Wilderness, lawlessness, dangers, conflicts, guns, horses, frontier, poverty, communities, railway. We cannot claim that Righetto's Regetto, novel is a Western novel, albeit of a special kind, if we do not def define the model that inspired our author. The conquest of the American West and the pioneer's triumph uh, over any kind of adversity in the wilderness involved the struggle for survival and always the necessity to overcome conflicts and challenges. Violence is an indispensable ingredient of any story. In fact, no frontier story exists without a gunfight, a confrontation, a, a duel, a battle. The Western novel and the Western film, like many popular genres, offer a formula and a regeneration through violence as theorized by Richard Slotkin. The frontier myth is based at its origin on a concept of regeneration through violence that entitles the justification of violence. Since the Western epic, both in films and fiction, is offered as the incarnation of the myth of the American's origin, it suggests that violence is a necessary phase of that process through which American society and the democratic values were asserted. The formula around which all the stories in films and fiction gravitate is based on three entities, the good guys heroes, the bad guys savages, and the communities, all tied together by a conflict of some sort. The epic journey of the heroes has also, has also ideological implications. In the Wild West, dreams of personal success can be realized and a better society can be born. As a consequence, the frontier is seen as a gift that God has given to man as a second chance for a new and better life. Classic American Westerns from Stagecoach, John Ford, 1939, until the beginning of the 60s, all exhibit the above characteristics. The reviewers of Soul of the Border and probably many readers were tempted to make a connection between Righetto's book and the Spaghetti Western because of the allure in front cover resembling a poster of Sergio Leone film. As I said, a heroine with a larger hat and a rifle walking through the wilderness. However, we should dig a, a little bit deeper into such a parallel. As we all know, Sergio Leone created the Italian Western in 1964 with his A Fistful of Dollars, followed in 65 with a four few dollars more, and in 66 with The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. Launching Clint Eastwood into stardom and initiating an unprecedented phenomenon in Italian cinema with films that gain enormous popularity and harvest incredible amounts of money at the box office all over the world during the decade 1965-1975. All the ingredients of the classic Western storyline characters at the end are present in Italian Westerns, but Leone and his followers tweak the formula in a way that changed the filmic genre forever. At the level of mise-en-scene, Leone changed the landscape and the look of the hero. 
at the level of genre, Leone altered the formula, avoiding it of the moral and cultural values that are the foundation of American identity. Great classic western from stagecoach to Shane, from high noon to the searchers, all exhibit an unchallenged sense of just, justice. There are, good, there, there are good and evil, and bad characters are doomed because justice always prevails in the end. The Italian filmmakers' western are like adult fables in which injustice can be defeated thanks to the exceptional skills of a man who uses violence to change almost unintentionally and momentarily his diegetic world. The Italian Western is charged with an anarchic and rebellious force that is largely missing from the older formula of most classic Westerns made in Hollywood. The mise-en-scene becomes a collection of props. The links between the Western and the historical events, the message, the myth of progress and democracy, and the regeneration through violence are stripped away. The archetypes of good versus evil remain, but undergo a thorough reinterpretation. Here the hero kills the bad guys because he wants money, and because deep down he hates a corrupt, unjust system that can be opposed only with violence. It could be tempting to establish a connection between Yole and Leone's anti-heroes insofar as she is prepared to use violence in order to obtain justice in the face of the establishment, which is indifferent, hostile, or oppressive. We cannot forget, however, that Yole, unlike Leone's anti-heroes, is not motivated by greed, but like the classic American heroes a la John Wayne, she resorts to violence when there is no other way out and she kills only to save her father. She is a pure soul and not a cynical killer. Like Eone's anti-heroes, she lives in a world without justice, where all the authorities, state, church, capital, slash tobacco company, have failed her and her family, but she believes in family love and has faith in God and nature. Righetto Soul of the Border, therefore recalls the classic American Western more than the spaghetti Western through its depiction of the heroine. In fact, the American Western formula does indeed fit the story. Our protagonists, Yole de Boer and her father, Augusto de Boer, are like the good cowboy hero of classic Western, brave, tenacious, good-hearted, honest, and their deeds trigger the adventure that we read about. The novel begins with the preparation for a smuggling trip, trip across the border in which Augusto has decided to take along his oldest daughter, 15 years old Yole. This is a close family that has deep emotional ties and they all work hard for the Royal Tobacco Company but earn barely enough to avoid starvation. The little hamlet in the high mountains of the Brenta Valley on the edge of the wilderness where they live called Nevada and we can talk about it, is a place of misfortune, and it's almost deserted because most of the mountain dwellers have emigrated abroad looking for a better life. As a result, in order to for, for survive, Augusto has become a, a, a smuggler. He has broken the law many times out of necessity, crossing the border with Italy and Austria in order to barter tobacco, hidden from the Royal Tobacco Company, for ingots of silver and copper to buy animals and food that will allow his family of five to live with a bit more of dignity. This is the dilemma that these peaceful and religious people who live in a natural environment of rare beauty in the end of the 19th century need to face. Obviously, smuggling put Augusto and Yole on a collision course with the powers to be the border guards of both the Austrian-Hungarian empires and the Italian kingdoms are a danger they need to avoid. In American Western novels, heroes are usually motivated by necessity, survival, and above all, a strong desire for a better life for which they venture into the wilderness. Our heroes of the novel, like the pioneers who moved west, want to improve their lot, but their journey is not the same. At the end of it, they cannot settle on the prairie and live peaceful forever after. Their passage through the wilderness is a round trip that will bring them back exactly where they started, with a bit more money, but only enough to buy food for a while, a temporary fix. 
Unlike cowboy heroes, our protagonists do not expect progress and democracy at the end of their journey, but after the battle, may be only a temporary success because they know that they live in a land with no hope, where the kings, Cecobete of Austria and Vittorio Emanuele II of Italy, never took the trouble to fill the bellies of the mountain dwellers, and they never will. Therefore, how could anybody in their situation as poor, uneducated mountain dwellers even think of progress and democracy in the kingdom of Italy at the end of the 19th century? Righetto has performed a transculturization. He has transformed American cowboys into Italian mountain dwellers who have suffered exploitation for generations. Democracy and progress cannot enter their dreams, neither can equality or justice. His protagonists harbor a strong mistrust towards those in power. Righetto has taken the Western classic formula the peaceful community oppressed by some danger, and has indigenized it by transforming his cowboy heroes into mountain dwellers of the Italian Northeast, who do look different, but share with the original heroes the passion for horses, freedom, and nature. He has further subverted the model by casting a girl as a replacement for the male cowboy hero. He has deteriorated deterritorialized the West, transferring it into the Dolomites uh, landscape, populating it with shepherds, charcoal makers, woodcutters, miners, criminals, and border guards. The locale might look different, but it is still a wide area where the law is either oppressive or absent, like in the American West. And the inhabitants need to protect themselves with guns. The cultural and geographical specificity of the setting is reflected through a range of details regarding, for example, the landscape, the Italian Northeastern Alps, the flora, pines, firs, chestnuts, larches, farm animals, burlina cows, feltrine sheep, wild beasts, vipers and wolves, but no cougars, rattlers or coyotes, weapons, quern, holub, and no Winchester or revolvers, and of course, types of people, shepherds and no vaqueros, highland tobacco farmers, and no ranchers. However, the writer has also stripped off some of the ideological valence of the original genre model. If battle, success, progress, and democracy are often the four elements that inform the American frontier narrative, we have pre previously demonstrated that only battle and a moderate success are present in Righetto's novel. In spite of that, we cannot forget that frontier mythology has constructed the hero as the one who can fight as savagely as the Indians' bandits, and as the one who can tame, as the one who can tame the wilderness endowed with the ability to survive in it like a native. The readiness to commit violent acts is one of the essential qualities of the American Western hero. It goes without saying that his violence regenerates the community because it liberates it from the evil forces that challenge its survival and its prosperity. The violence of the hero is the violence of the just. His killing stems from the necessity of defending himself or the community from the bad guys or from the necessity of taking revenge for a crime suffered. Yole, our heroine, and Augusto, our co-protagonist, exhibit courage, tenacity, the capacity to feel at home in the wild, and they are able to exact justice on the bad guys through violence. When the criminal charcoal maker hits Augusto with a shovel after he has liberated his daughter, Yole grabs her father's rifle and kills the man. Joe's killing has to be considered as an act of justice. The evil rap rapist gets what he deserved according to frontier justice, or he had it coming, as in the popular saying uh, of many Western films. Our heroine does what she does, what she has to do in order to save herself and her father. She is, like most Western heroes, an avenger, not a murderer. Despite the similarity between the original model and our novel, the regeneration through violence should be considered a bit less important, um, and a bit less important than the regeneration through violence. Um, sorry, the regeneration through violence should be considered a bit less important than the regeneration through family love. 
Yole survives all the misfortunes, including the killing of a man, because she's happy to go home with her father to see her mother, her siblings, carrying the future in the form of precious metal bars that would assure a better life for them all. Love for family is the force that moves all the action of our heroes, helps them to survive, and gives them the strength to go on. Our analysis of Righetto's novel would not be complete without looking at the title of the book. If, in literature, usually the title of the novel is linked directly or indirectly to the content of the story, we need to look into our text to dig out all the possible connections. What is the soul of the border? The two nouns, soul and border, at first seem an oddity. One is an abstract name and the other is a geographical mark. But at a closer scrutiny, they are both abstract because borders are imaginary lines created by men, usually to delimit the, ter the territories that they have conquered. In this sense, the border in our novel is the imaginary line that, crossing over the Alps, divide the Kingdom of Italy from the Austro-Hungarian Empire. This is, meaning, this is the meaning of the border for the institution involved and the custom guards. However, for Augusto and Oriole, the border is something entirely different. For them, the border is a call to survive, a challenge they take for the love of the family. It's a way to react against the anger and injustice inflicted by the custom officer and the tobacco company. And, and as a consequence, the border becomes an irresistible call to freedom from the yoke of oppression. On top of the mountain peaks near the border for Augusto Iole, the wind embodies, and I'm quoting, the legendary soul of the border, an ancient spirit, at least as old as the mountains, a spirit that blows hard and moves from century to century, following the borders of man. For our protagonists, nature doesn't have borders. The birds, the wolves, the animals, the trees are always the same on this side as on the other side of the frontier. The border is, therefore, an imaginary line drawn by men to subjugate other men, either to keep them in or out. For our mountain dweller, the real border in society is the division between the rich and the poor, between those who have food and power and those who starve and break their back, back for envo or polenta, corn flour. The border becomes for our protagonist a symbol of class division between the privileged minority and the underprivileged majority. The soul of the border is a wind that carries at times bitter words of anger, vengeance, and justice. But in the end, the most important border that Iole crosses is the discovery of the line that divides good from evil in every human mind, soul. By the time the reader reaches the end of the novel, it's evident that the core of the story, like in any true Western novel, pivots on corruption, vengeance, and salvation, but also on family love, sacrifice, endurance, and rebirth. Righetto has relocated the American frontier into the Veneto region of Italy, executing a successful fictional transculturization. I'm almost done. For Gloria Anzaldua, border, the author of oh, Borderland La Frontera, 1987, to live in the borderlands is like living between two countries without being really accepted on either side. However, to be exposed to multiple social worlds give, gives to its inhabitants, especially women, the ability to navigate and challenge monocultural and monolingual conception of social reality and gives them the capacity to resist oppression. Anzuldua theorization of the borderland could be applied also to the situation of the protagonist of Soul of the Border. Yole is especially sensitive to oppression. She is poor, a poor mountain farmer without education, trapped in a land between Italy and Austria in a zone ignored by the king, by the Italian king, and by the emperor of Austria, because annexed to Savoia Kingdom a few years before. In this landscape, dominated by wonderful nature, Yole and her family work hard but cannot make ends meet. From this impasse stem Yole's desire to cross the border and venture into a dangerous world that seems to offer some possibility of survival. The oppression that Yole suffers can only be mitigated to a point by the love for family and nature. 
In fact, in the two volumes of Raghetto trilogy that continue to conclude the saga of the De Boer family, Yole will rebel against her father's acceptance of his subjugation, will join with other disenfranchised fellow mountaineers from Veneto, and will emigrate to the New World. Yole, living between two countries without being really accepted on either side, decides to resist oppression, leaving her own land and challenge other realities and other culture, carrying in her heart wherever she goes the soul of the border and therefore the strength to, re to search for a better future. Thank you.